brings us to the conclusion of how CWT can be applied to singularity detection. The third application that we want to look at is the estimation of instantaneous frequencies. Now, the idea here is pretty much similar to what you have seen in spectrogram. We said the local maxima, just like we evaluated the local maxima for singularity detection, we could also use the local maxima for computing the instantaneous frequencies. In spectrogram, we call this as the Fourier windowed Fourier ridges and in wavelet uh, transform world, we call these as wavelet ridges. Essentially, what you do is you plot the uh, scalogram and follow the uh, local maxima in a, and then uh, that is spot the scales or the frequencies at which you see the local maxima and those give, will give you the instantaneous frequency estimates. And it is important to use analytic wavelet transforms that is you should use analytic or complex morlet type wavelets to uh, really exploit this uh, property. To give you an example here which I borrowed from Stefan Mallet's book, what we do is uh, we perform uh, we compute the scalogram of a linear chirp computed with a Gebor wavelet. Uh, well, a Gebor wavelet is essentially a morlet wavelet and the expression for the normalized scalogram is given here. And as you can see from this expression, the scale normalized scalogram reaches a maximum at, uh, at omega of tau which is 2 times a times tau. Now, this 2 a tau is nothing but the derivative of the phase of this linear chirp which is nothing but the instantaneous frequency itself. So, therefore, the points of maxima of the normalized scalogram will give me the instantaneous frequency estimate. So, again these are called ridges. What is important is for your wavelet ridges to really come up with this uh, decent estimates of instantaneous frequencies. It is important that the signal has certain characteristics in itself that is how the frequencies change with time. It is not that your wavelet ridges will always give you very good estimates of instantaneous frequency. It depends on how they are separated in time and how the amplitudes also change that is how what kind of amplitude modulations you have in the signal. So, the mathematical conditions and all of that are given nicely in Mallet's book, but we will not dwell into that. Let me just show you a couple of examples again borrowed from Stefan Mallet's book. This again is reproduced from Mallet's book with the help of Wavelab. The signal on the left is a mixture of a linear chirp plus a quadratic chirp and a couple of Gaussian atoms. And from the figure, we should be able to figure out where these Gaussian atoms are located. First of all, what you see here on the top is the signal itself and what you see on the bottom are the ridges again computed using Wavelab. And you can see that the ridges have nicely detected the linear and the quadratic uh, varying nature of the frequencies. And you can see some small shadows here, gray shadows here which essentially indicate the presence of Gaussian atoms that is where they are located in the signal. In fact, you can generate the signal using uh, wave lab. On the right, we have a sum of hyperbolic chirps. The expression for the hyperbolic sum of hyperbolic chirps is given at the top. The values of beta and beta, beta 1 and beta 2 are also given in Mallet's book, but more than the values what is important for us is to see whether the wavelet ridges have correctly come up with the instantaneous frequency estimates. So, the top here once again is the signal and the bottom here are the ridges. It is clear now that the wavelet ridges have come up with very good estimates of the instantaneous frequencies. Recall if I use the standard instantaneous frequency definition for any of the signals, the instantaneous frequency estimates will break down. The standard procedure consists of constructing an analytic representation and taking the derivative of the phase. So, that would not work here. What is being done here is we are estimating instantaneous frequencies in an indirect manner. Let us look at an example where the wavelet ridges really perform a poor job and the uh, STFT ridges perform a very good job and that is the case for the sum of linear chirps again borrowed from Mallet's book in chapter 4 and the expression for the sum of linear chirps is given at the top. The ridges computed from scalogram are shown uh, to the left and the one computed from the spectrogram are shown to the right and it is clear from this plot here that 
the ridges computed from the wavelet scale from the scalogram sh start showing oscillatory behavior that is because at this point in time the, f the nature uh, that is the separability that can be achieved by wavelet ridges uh, the has broken down that is th there is a certain mathematical condition that is not fulfilled any longer here. The, the frequencies are too close for the wavelets to resolve and amplitude modulations are also not good enough. Whereas here the spectrogram is able to resolve this. Why is there a difference here? Because in when I use when I compute the spectrogram I choose a fixed window width and across the entire time frequency plane. right? So therefore the time frequency resolution or localization is fixed whereas with the scalogram recall that as I move into the high frequency regime the there is more smearing of the energy which means the resolvability of high frequencies is broken down and that is exactly what is happening here. If I had this high frequencies in time uh, initially that is at short beginning rather than at later times then also that would be the same story because it is all about the frequency resolution uh, ab uh, resolving ability of this particular technique. Because wavelets use a time frequency varying uh, windows that is the bandwidths are varying you have this problem whereas with spectrogram the time frequency spreads are fixed along the ti uh, time scale or time frequency plane and therefore the resolvability is the same in the entire time frequency plane. So that is the main thing. You would not run into this interferences if these interferences were occurring at low frequencies for example. So the scalogram would be absolutely fine with that all right. Now let us discuss the final application of uh, the continuous wavelet transform that we set out to do in this lecture which is filtering and feature extraction using inverse continuous wavelet transform. Very often there are many features in the signal that I would like to extract and leave aside the remaining uh, features. And for this we look at the synthesis equation. You may recall the synthesis equation from the first lecture on continuous wavelet transform. C psi is the admissibility constant and what this expression essentially suggests that is of course this is valid only when the wavelet is admissible. What this expression suggests is that we could reconstruct a part of the signal by working with a modified CWT. What we mean by modification is thresholding is that is thresholding the CWT. That is what we could do is we could take the CWT and zero out a few coefficients like we did in spectrogram or even in periodogram where I showed you how you could filter. Here also what I could do is I could say that the CWT is significant only in a certain time scale plane and I am going to zero out or threshold out the CWT in the remaining uh, region of the time scale plane and then reconstruct the part of X of T which is desirable. And this is going to be the basic idea also in DWT. So therefore, this is kind of a curtain raiser for you for signal estimation using DWT. So let us discuss a few mathematical aspects. Let us understand for example, what is this role of admissibility constant in synthesis. This was one of the questions that was also asked in the forum. So I am going to spend a couple of minutes on explaining why this C psi should appear in this equation and why is it that the wavelet should be admissible for you to recover X of T perfectly. That is the first question we shall look at. And the second question that we shall look at is can we use one wavelet for analysis and another one for synthesis? Can we do that? Well the answer is yes. Then how does this reconstruction equation change? And thirdly of course we could uh, use for feature extraction and I will show you uh, an example of that. When, when I say feature here it could be an oscillatory feature also. So let us look at the first question why is C psi coming into my synthesis equation and why is it that the wavelet should have a finite C psi. Let us start with the part of the reconstruction equation ignoring 1 over C psi. So what I have done is I have thrown away 1 over C psi and I am only looking at this double integral. But if you recall here the psi of tau comma s is nothing but 1 over root s psi of t minus tau by s which means what is happening is the wavelet transform is being convolved 
with the wavelet. Therefore, I can rewrite this double integral as an integral of a convolution of t with the psi scaled mother wave. So, essentially what we have done is we have taken one integral and recognized that to be convolution and that is what we have done. The next integral is of course, over scales. Now, what we shall uh, and let us denote this with x tilde of t. So, x tilde and x of t only differ by c psi. Now, let us take the Fourier transform of this integral. So, that on the left hand side I have x tilde of omega. Uh, this is a small uh, error here. This y of t should be x tilde of t. Then by the Fourier transform property. So, here I am taking Fourier transform of the integral and we will uh, switch the order. We will say Fourier transform of the integral is the integral of the Fourier transform. We can do that under certain mild conditions. Then the convolution becomes a product in the Fourier domain. Here we are convolving with respect to tau and therefore, the Fourier transform is also with respect to tau. We have made use of the Fourier transform properties. Now, again recall that the continuous wavelet transform itself is a convolution of the signal with the reflected version of the wavelet. right? Therefore, I can write the Fourier transform of the wavelet tran uh, transform with respect to tau as a product of x of omega times root s psi star of s of omega. Now, when I put together equations 9 and 10, then I have this expression with me. x tilde of omega is x of omega because I substitute for t x of omega uh, with the expression with the RHS that I have in 10. So, x of omega falls out of the integral because it is independent of the scale s. The rest of it stays with the integral. I have psi star of s of omega time, uh, s times omega times psi of s, o, s omega which becomes a magnitude square of psi of s omega. Root s times root s I have here as s and that cancels out 1 s here. In the end I have integral 0 to infinity mod psi of s omega square by s ds. And you can quickly recognize that this expression is nothing but my c psi, this integral is c psi. So, x tilde what we have started off with is the integral ignoring the c psi and we have shown that if I ignore the c psi, then I will recover x up to this factor c psi. Obviously, to recover perfectly, I need to divide x tilde by c psi and that is exactly what we are doing. So, it follows that the signal is perfectly recoverable if and only if c psi is less than infinity. It has to be bounded. If c psi is infinity, then you cannot recover it, right? Uh, recover the signal itself. So, that is the reason why the admissibility constant c psi comes into the synthesis equation. In fact, we can also use this derivation to understand the concept of scaling function. Suppose we use only the wavelet coefficients at scales s greater than 1 in my reconstruction. So, I go back here. Uh, here into this equation 8 or even in the synthesis equation that I had in equation 6. I only select scales greater than 1 which means I am ignoring all the details below uh, at scales below 1. Then what happens to this integral? Well, going by the same uh, procedure we can show that then the x hat of omega let us call that as x hat of omega because x tilde of omega looks at is recovered using all scales x hat of omega is recovered with all uh, the wavelet coefficients at all scales greater than 1. Then x hat of omega is x of omega times this integral. But if you recall from the concept of uh, from the lecture on scaling function that we had, this integral here is nothing but your scaling function in the Fourier domain. So, x hat of omega differs from x by this factor phi of omega. So, when I use the wavelet coefficients at scales greater than 1, then I only recover that part of x which is the x multiplied with phi. So, it is as if I am filtering x with some Fourier frequency uh, with some uh, LTI system whose frequency response function is phi of omega. Now, we know already that phi of t acts as a low pass filter because the phi of omega at omega equals 0 is a non-zero quantity. Therefore, I know phi of omega is nothing but the a frequency response function of a low pass filter and therefore, I can say that x hat of omega or x hat of t which is inverse Fourier transform of x hat of omega is nothing but a, an approximation or a low pass filtered version of x of t. So, you see the synthesis equation can be used to understand both 
the role of admissibility and the scaling function. Now, let us move on to this second question and then we will look at an example. Can I use two different wavelets? Why are we even discussing this problem? Because it turns out that this is the key <coughs> to coming up with an implementable inverse continuous wavelet transform algorithm. Can I use a different analysis and synthesis wavelet? First of all, why does this idea even come up? Because CWT is a redundant representation of the signal. That means, I have computed far more coefficients than actually required. So, I could pick any subset and I, and I can perform any operation on a subset of these coefficients and I should be able to recover uh, using a different function. And that is why I can think of a different analysis and synthesis function. In DWT using orthogonal wavelets, the analysis and synthesis functions have to be identical and that we will learn in DWT. So, let us denote the analyzing wavelet with C, uh, psi of t and synthesizing wavelet with psi tilde. Then the recovery expression that we had seen the synthesis equation now generalizes to this integral where the only difference there are two differences in place of psi I have psi tilde and in place of c psi I have c psi psi tilde. That means, now I have a generalized admissibility constant which is also known as a two wavelet admissibility constant. What is this two wavelet admissibility constant? Well, and wh what is uh, this admissibility? Essentially what intuitively this means is that the analyzing wavelet and the synthesizing wavelet should be compatible. You cannot really use some arbitrary uh, two different arbitrary wavelets, one for analysis and one for synthesis. There has to be some correspondence between them and that correspondence or compatibility, C for compatibility is measured by this C for uh, C psi psi tilde. Right. In fact, when you set psi tilde equal psi, that is when you choose the synthesis function same as the analysis function, then you will recover the same condition that we had seen earlier. Now, all that is left is to derive the expression that is practically used in implementing the inverse CWT. This is a slightly involved uh, topic therefore, you may have to uh, pay a bit more attention, but it, there is a very nice trick. If you understand the trick, then the rest of the story is fairly straightforward. What we have here is a double integral and implementing this double integral in practice is the biggest hurdle. We would somehow like to reduce this double integral to a single integral that is what we would like to do. right? How do we do that? Well, the trick is to use psi tilde as a Dirac. Strictly speaking, Dirac is a distribution, but it's just some slight abuse of uh, notation and terminology and some uh, slight giving up of technicality. We will still call this a Dirac function. So, I use a synthesizing uh, Dirac as a synthesizing wavelet. What is the advantage? The advantage is the this inner integral that I have or you can say whatever integral we have with respect to d tau that reduces to a point. Uh, that is if I plug in this expression for psi, uh, psi tilde into this uh, equation 13, then the integral across d tau takes this form. As a result, the uh, double integral in 13 simplifies to a simple single integral over the scales. That is the basic idea. And normally one uses a complex analytic wavelet uh, in CWT. So, what the what we have learnt is that I can use a different analysis and synthesis wavelet and we use a synthesis uh, direct uh, function as a synthesizing wavelet because we want to make our life simpler. We want to reduce a double integral to a single, in single integral and reduce the computational burden. That is the basic essence in inverse CWT. And because we generally use a complex uh, wavelet or an analytic wavelet for CWT, you can rewrite further that expression that we had here. That is the moment you plug in this uh, simplification in, in 16 into the equation in 13, you will have a single integral which would have 1 over psi, psi, uh, c psi psi tilde times integral 0 to infinity. S, uh, uh, sorry, T x of tau comma s times 1 over s power 3 by 2 d s. So, that would be the single integral that you would have. When you use a complex analytic wavelet, you have to pluck the real version from the uh, wavelet transform and that is how you get this expression 
In fact, if you are really curious on how you get this expression from the CWT computed using analytic wavelets, then you can just refer to a very quick three line derivation of this uh, equation 17 in Mallet's book. You can still synthesize even if, even if you do not use complex analytic wavelets that you should remember that fact. Because we normally use analytic wavelets, we have given this expression. Once again, here I have C psi delta because now I have chosen uh, psi tilde to be delta. So, that is the two wavelet admissibility constant that has to be computed and that differs from wavelet to wavelet. In general, we implement a discretized version of this because I cannot compute CWT over a continuum of scales, I would have computed only over a grid. Now, if I choose to discretize this linearly, that is the scale axis linearly, then I would get this expression here, right. That is a fairly straightforward expression. But normally, one would choose a dyadic grid for the scales, in which case the uh, expression in 18 is not the correct one for implementing the, discre uh, the discretized version of this. You will have to assume s equals 2 power j and then evaluate d s in terms of j. And when I write s equals 2 power j, we vary j linearly and therefore, this integral has to be rewritten in terms of j and then discretized. So, that is a basic difference. If I linearize, if I um, linearly discretize the scales, I can directly use an approximate, uh, approximate version of 17 as in given in 18. But if I choose a dyadic grid, then I have to rewrite 17 in terms of the linear parameter j and then write the discretized version of that. That is the basic difference and that those expressions are given in the literature in the paper by Torrance and Compo and so on and that is what is implemented in MATLAB as well. Now, the only thing that you have to remember is and also observe that we have used an approximation symbol here, which means that the recovery is no longer exact. Why? Because we have replaced the integral with a summation. In DWT, this is not going to be the case because the discretization that we choose for scales will allow us to exactly recover x of t. So, that is the basic difference between performing inverse CWT and inverse DWT. Of course, the reconstruction error will depend on the grid spacing and this constant C psi tilde is available in the literature uh, and can be computed for a specific wavelet. Now, we turn to an exa two examples here. In the first example, all I am trying to show you is a simple implementation of how uh, things in MATLAB. We have a signal, a sign, uh, uh, a mixed sign here and we have generated samples of that. And what we are doing here is computing the CWT using the FFT algorithm and then computing the inverse. So, what we are doing is we are not doing anything to the continuous wavelet transform. We are just computing the CWT and then trying to recover the signal. That is all we are doing. We are not performing any operation on the CWT, no thresholding. So, I use the ICWT FT routine in MATLAB's wavelet toolbox. The, uh, there is an ICWT version that is to be used when you use CWT, that is the convolution algorithm to compute the wavelet transform. This ICWT FT assumes that the argument that you are supplying has been computed from CWT FT. So, that is important. So, these are the two uh, complementary functions. And what I am showing you here on the left is the reconstructed version and the original version. The original version is shown in blue and the reconstructed one is shown in red. The There is some error as we talked about in the reconstruction and that error is quantified in terms of the root mean square error and they, it turns out to be 1.1 percent. That is because we have chosen such a grid spacing. If I choose even a finer grid spacing and I would like you to just explore that, go and change the grid spacing when you compute the CWT FT and you will find that you can uh, for a finer grid spacing for scales, you can actually get lower RMSCs. So, let us conclude our lecture with this example where we will again take the same example sin 8 pi t plus sin uh, 30 pi t, the same signal that we saw earlier. And what I show you here is the contour plot of the CWT. You can uh, on the y axis I have scales, on x axis I have time. Clearly, it shows me this two time scales that I have in the signal. Of course, there is a smearing of the energy as expected. 
And now what we would like to know is can I extract the sin 8 pi t which is one part of the signal or sin 30 pi t which is another part of the signal by performing an inverse filtering. What you would technically do is zero out the CWT at those scales that are not of interest to you and only retain the CWT uh, for the scales that are of interest to you. Uh, that is technically what you could do and that is what we mean by hard thresholding and that is what is achieved by this ICWTFT with this IDXSC routine. When you, when you use this option in addition to the, uh, in addition to passing the continuous wavelet transform. By the way, uh, we have also added some noise here to the original signal, some mild amounts of noise. So, we may be in the process of filtering, we will also get rid of some noise. So, here I have the uh, component reconstructed of the high frequency part and high frequencies correspond to low scales. So, what I have done is I have looked at this plot and decided that I want to construct the high frequency one which is corresponding to the scales here and I pick the indices of those scales. How do I pick the indices of the scales? From the plot I read what scales are of interest to me and y k underscore c w t has is a structure and uh, which contains a scales field. So, I go uh, it is a vector. I pick the indices that correspond to the scales of interest to me here for the high frequency and those turn out to be 7 to 12. Those are the vector uh, indices and that is all. So, that gets me the high frequency component. Likewise, I pick the low frequency component that means I have to look at higher scales. So, I pick this set of scales for reconstructing. As you can see, we are, uh, our reconstruction is really very good. Of course, these are all academic examples, but this actually shows you how you can extract features from CWT. There were quite a few questions uh, on the forum and sent personally to me on how you could uh, one could extract features from CWT. This is how you could do it. Uh, you could do, you could be, you compute the CWT and then perform certain operations on the CWT or if you want the uh, a a part of X of T that exists over the entire time, but only over select set of scales, then you could use this option. But on the other hand, if I only wanted that part of X of T, let us say between 0.4 and 0.6 in this scale region, then what I would do is I would really zero out the continuous wavelet tra transform coefficients outside this band of time scale uh, region and then pass that to ICWTFT and that would reconstruct that part of the feature. So, that is essentially the procedure for you. So, that is it. It was a long lecture, but hopefully a lot of interesting applications for you. You can take these applications and see whether uh, they relate to the kind of work that you have been uh, doing or you plan to do. And in doing so, not only refer to these lecture notes, but more importantly refer to some of these excellent books uh, by uh, Missiti et al. and Torrance and uh, paper by Torrance and Compo and of course, Mallet's book. And I gratefully acknowledge the software package by Grinstead and Moore and uh, of course, the WaveLab toolbox as well, which is not listed here. Uh, we will put that up in the reference list. And I just want to conclude that what we have shown is application of wavelets to univariate signal analysis. There are a number of applications of wavelets to bivariate and multivariate signals. In fact, if you read the top reference, it reads cross wavelet and wave coherence. That is essentially looking at wavelet analysis of two signals. It is a cross wavelet analysis and there are, a there are these routines available in the free package here as well as of course, in the MATLAB wavelet toolbox that allow you to perform wavelet analysis of bivariate or multivariate signals. Uh, but because this course is fairly restric is restricted and confined to univariate analysis, we have only discussed the applications of CWT to univariate signals. So, that is it. So, that brings us to the conclusion of CWT. In the next lecture that is in 8.1, we set out uh, on uh, learning what is a DWT and how does one compute it and so on. So, see you in the next lecture. Bye.